Hello, my name is Michael Nimala. I'm making the short documentary for the uh, My Art Appreciation course uh, for the instructor Erin Jones. She said she's excited because I'm the first student ever to attempt this and if it's too terrible I'll probably be the last student to ever do this. Uh, today I'm in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge. Uh, it's a little snowy out so I'm starting out in here because it's warmer. Uh, I'll be starting with Stonehenge a uh, replica of Stonehenge. Uh, Sam Hill built it as a war memorial for the veterans of the First World War and then later on another war memorial was added for other veterans from Klickitat County. Uh, then I'll be moving on to the Mary Hill Museum where I'll be looking at the home, his home, that he built and then subsequently became the Mary Hill Museum of art. So I'll be moving on now to more interesting things than me. Okay, I'm outside now. It's a little snowy and I'm going to give you a better view of the surrounding countryside and give you an idea of what, uh, where this is. Uh, you can look and you can see from the pan here briefly uh, that we're, I'll get a better shot, uh, that Sam Hill chose a very picturesque and very beautiful spot for this. And let's just move over here to a better view. Okay, now here's the better view. That is the Columbia River Gorge facing from Washington into Oregon. And here we have the replica of Stonehenge. Uh, it is a post and lintel building construction. It has, uh, it's just a very basic structure with the outer ring and the inner rings taken from the original Stonehenge site. And this is actually the first monument in our nation to fallen soldiers. And if we look, Sam Hill had a, uh, was very particular when he did these types of things. He was very, very consistent in the fact that he, when he built something like this, he wanted it to be as realistic or as close to the original as possible. He was a, a very interesting man. My great grandfather knew him. And uh, back to the Stonehenge itself, here we have the center, central altar and the pillars. We have the outer circle, the inner circle, and finally the full altar. Uh, there is a lot of debate as to the purpose of Stonehenge, but one thing that is consistently agreed on is that it can be used to uh, predict solar eclipses, when the equinox is going to be, it's a, it can be used as a calendar by a person who knows what they're doing. And I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm not going to even try. Uh, this altar has been actually used by myself on several occasions to lay on and watch the night sky and think about uh, wonderful things. This standing, living, organic piece of art reaches back across time and space and makes a person think about the people that built it in ancient times, what they did. They came here for healing, not only of their mind and body, but of their spirit to send the dead on as they celebrated their ancestors and their life to follow the stars and to 
predict when summer would come, when the planting seasons would come. It's just an amazing, magnificent work that Sam Hill replicated and preserved beautifully for the generations and as an honor to those who gave their lives in service to this country. When you walk out the other side of Stonehenge, you walk through and you come out and you look out into the gorge, you can see not only the magnificence of the gorge, but you can also see where Sam Hill built uh, the settlement of Mary Hill. That was the uh, jail slash ice house. And then down below, you can see, see if I can zoom in on it a little bit. Nope, it won't let me. Uh, you can see the Mary Hill Chapel that he built before the bridge, before the dams. Uh, there was a uh, there was a ferry that went across the river, and he put the first ferry in. He built the highway system through here. Uh, that is how he actually amassed his fortune was building roads. And you can see down in that draw there, leading down to where the house is, right there. I'll point. He used the countryside and the landscape. He initially built a dam up in there, up through that draw, that came down and it provided water to his community. Uh, he used nature and a philosophy that things could be functional and beautiful when building roads and building things like this monument. Uh, Sam, Hill. Uh, Sam Hill was a genius. Uh, he built amazing things for the time. Uh, he was a true visionary and his work has influenced even beyond this part of the world. Uh, you even hear his influence in old Looney Tunes cartoons when you hear Yosemite Sam say, where in the Sam Hill is everyone gone? Uh, that's because as soon as he brought a bunch of indentured servants over from Romania, they saw this lush, beautiful, amazing countryside, and they headed for the hills, the Sam Hills. <laughs> now I'm going to go over to the uh, more modern war memorial, uh, where we can see uh, the more modern influence of uh, May Lin, in making and the Vietnam Wall. Now over here uh, away from the Stonehenge site a little bit is the modern uh, modern war memorial of for fallen heroes from Klickitat County. Um, I'll, get a, I'll get a footage of that in just a minute to kind of give you an idea of how they've kind of placed it out here and the feeling that it conveys of, you know, here's this kind of this desolate area that flows into this simple structure honoring uh, our fallen heroes. So give me just a moment. See, there's, there's Stonehenge in the distance. Uh, the memorial with uh, of our, uh, the original memorial from World War I, one of the very if not the very first uh, war memorial for fallen heroes in this country. And you come over and you kind of follow it and leading up to the modern memorial off the beaten path where you have to choose to come over here. You have to go out of your way to come up here and see this. Uh, it reminds me of the work by Mei Lin because of how it doesn't necessarily go into the hillside, but it feels like it's part of the hillside. The stone and the brown and the mirror 
uh, the organic colors that go with the stone and the desolation of this area where you start at one end and move to the other and uh, you're being reflected you see your own reflection as you look at uh, as you look at the names of those that have fallen uh, that is my best friend growing up uh, he actually gave his life disarming IEDs in Afghanistan uh, keeping civilians safe he there was something about the situation he didn't like and uh, instead of sending in one of his men Mark went himself and uh, that's, that was very much Mark he was a great man a force of nature and someone who cared and loved for people through his entire life and seeing this work seeing this area and how healing this place can be and how it all just flows together you know it's uh, it's very powerful it's a very very powerful work I forgot to mention you have to climb up into the memorial uh, a very uh, interesting work I think the artist did that on purpose because you're climbing in and you have this burden and then as you come back out the art the organic uh, the art works with you as a release you're coming down you are feeling better and it takes you back down out here into the natural world so I think somebody really put some thought into that it's a beautiful place and uh, I'll show you uh, I'll go show you uh, Sam Hill's mansion which is now the Mary Hill Museum it's about three miles that way to the to the west and I think you will enjoy it well of course because of the time of year the gates are closed there's snow on the ground and I guess because there is snow on the ground the museum is closed I can't even get down to the building without trespassing 20 years ago I would have done it now not so much so I'm gonna get some shots of the in the distance here for you that is Sam Hill's mansion that is now the Mary Hill Museum now if you look to the left and to the right of the building there those ramps were built so that you go down the driveway you come in and his friends when he invited them to the party could drive their cars because at that time they were like model A model T T's they could drive up and turn around and go back down if the weather was bad like it is now uh, they could actually drive their driver could drive them through let them out in the main hall and then drive through the other side of the building and drive down the other side and come around um, and you can see the road that leads back up <laughs> over there uh, Sam Hill was an interesting man if you look at the top of the building there where those look like parapets and spires that is actually what is called the starlight bedroom and the starlight bedroom was where he would he had actually an outdoor bedroom where during the summer he and his guests would sleep out there to stargaze and they would spend an incredible you know uh, they would go out to enjoy uh, the scenery and to enjoy the night air during the summer the inside of the building is just as interesting it's just as amazing and I really wish this museum was not closed because um, it's 
a fascinating piece of work. Uh, he, I just, I can't describe how wonderful that building is. Uh, in the basement on the bottom there is the Rodin exhibit. Sorry about the traffic. Uh, is the Rodin exhibit. There are Rodins there because he was the friend of the Queen of Romania at the beginning of World War I. Uh, Sam Hill was able... Uh, she wanted to protect her property, Romania's property, from the Kaiser uh, of Germany. And so she gave him treasures, Romanian treasures from uh, the Royal Treasury. Uh, many of those were works of art, such as the Rodin. There are other works of art in there. There's a display of, oh gosh, there's uh, local native art in there. There's all kinds of things. But the Queen of Romania gave him uh, national Romanian treasures that you cannot see anywhere else in the world, and also Rodins that you cannot see anywhere else in the world. And I really wanted to share those on this project. My original plan of covering uh, the Mary Hill Museum has been interrupted. I am going to continue this project with local architecture in and around uh, Klickitat County. Uh, not as fascinating, I don't think, but to many, but to me, it's interesting. So I'm going to start here with the grain elevator. Now, at the base here, you see this mammoth structure that reaches up. And it's not pretty, but it serves a great function. It stores grain. Farmers come from all over the county. And it is a great piece of architecture simply because of its size and its construction can hold thousands of tons of grain and store it safely so that it can be shipped anywhere in the world and be distributed for food. Uh, the, it's a farming community that I live in. This farming community dates back uh, well over a hundred years. My family has lived in the same house for almost a hundred years now. I'll be showing you that house later. Uh, it's part of a, uh, it was a Sears kit uh, that was sold at the turn of the century and many homes around here were built from pretty much that same kit because my great-grandfather helped people, a lot of people build their homes. But for now, uh, I'm going to move on to a local attraction called the Presby Mansion that is a uh, small small museum here in town. Well, here I am at the Presby House Museum, also known to the locals as the Presby Mansion. Uh, there's an old tractor that's been sitting there, steam-powered tractor. This is one of the oldest homes in the area. You can see the widow walk on the top has the spires, older spires that are rotunda. Uh, it's actually a very, very beautiful, beautiful piece of architecture uh, inside and out. Unfortunately, they are closed for the winter. But just to give you an idea of what small town Goldendale, Washington used to look like. Uh, the Presby Helm house is a very, very good example of that. sneak up and see what's written on the rock. Whoops! <laughs> Found the edge of that. 
go. There we go. This was the Clickitat Academy, 1896 to 1906, in memory of Charles Timblin and Lucille Timblin, pioneers of higher education in Clickitat County. His work is a lasting influence for good in this community. Erected by their students June 15th, 1922. So this was a uh, place of higher learning at one time as well. Uh, this was also the hospital at one point. The building has uh, quite the history here. Uh, it was not only a place of learning, it was also at one point the hospital, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, the doctor lived here, the only doctor in the area lived here. Uh, to get a This, uh, this area is full of very old buildings, very old homes, uh, the church, old churches, uh, and a surprise at the end here, uh, I'll be showing you the only observatory that is open to the public in North America here in a few, in a few more little segments. But just to show you some more of the older homes in the area. This home is right across the street from the Presby Mansion. Then we move into newer architecture. Uh, probably not the ideal, like Renaissance versus or Greek uh, structures that perhaps this was originally thought of, but this is a small town America, Western United States architecture. Uh, form follows function. The roofs were made steep to uh, keep snow off. Uh, the widow's walk on the top there uh, is kind of a brought over from the east coast where on the where uh, it was called a widow's walk because widows would walk on the top of the house looking out into the bay uh, searching for their husbands to come home from sea. So, but then we have the pillars on the porch. Uh, it's really quite beautiful. The, the you look closely at the foundation, it is a rock foundation. Uh, a lot of the foundations on the older homes around here are rock. Uh, even though they had cement at the time, many people could not afford to put cement for their foundations or their basements. So onward to the next site. Now no tour of Goldendale architecture uh, would be complete without visiting the infamous Red House. Uh, the Red House was built by a captain for his Native American wife, who was a princess, as legend goes. And they lived here quite happily, and now their ghosts haunt the place, and nobody really rents the place for very long periods of time. Uh, people say it's because it's haunted, but I've heard it's because it's drafty. So I'll just flip this around and we can get a look at the Red House. Now there's the Red House. Uh, it has more of a eastern feel to it, really. Uh, most of the homes around here are not this tall, uh, from what I understand as legend goes. Uh, he built this house more to the specifications of his wife than to good sense. <laughs> so the house has always been red. Uh, it has always had this design. It's always had the stained glass windows. Uh, it has always had the uh, everything you see is as it pretty much has always been. Uh, you can see a few newer windows in it 
but as far as the stained glass windows go and the color of the home and how it's painted, uh, this has actually been preserved as much as humanly possible down to the rock chimney uh, off the back building in the back. So, um, about a hundred years of myth and legend follow this home, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, this is uh, uh, how, pretty much how it looked as when it was constructed. Continuing our architectural tour through the grand metropolis of Goldendale, Washington, uh, I thought next we could take a look at the county courthouse, uh, the Masonic Temple, and an older older garage. Uh, they're all fairly utilitarian, but I think they were, well, they were all built in the early to mid-1900s, and they are all representational of form following function in architecture, yet still having a certain aesthetic to it, as we will see with the courthouse. With the courthouse, it has been modernized a bit. Uh, those are not the original steps, but the colors and the main building itself has not changed. Uh, it is as it was built many years ago and uh, stands, stands to this day. Now it's blocky, uh, it's not very inspired, but if you follow the lines, uh, there's a geometric symmetry to it that makes it, that gives it a feeling of timelessness and a feeling of stability and continuity and that it will always be here for the people. And then on the other side of the street, we have the Masonic Temple. Uh, they recently painted the front of it a bit, but it is brick and mortar. Uh, it was built in the early 19th century, and it has, uh, it's just a very simple utilitarian building, as is uh, the old shop next to it. That building has been standing since approximately the mid-1900s, 30s. Uh, it was either built in the 30s or the 40s. And it is also an example of basic geometric utilitarian architecture from that time frame. Uh, those types of structures really haven't changed over time, except for perhaps building materials. Uh, we'll be going on a short tour of downtown Goldendale. There's the back of Main Street there. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, they have a lot of uh, the old style style fronts on them. Uh, some of the buildings do, some of the buildings don't. Uh, it's a mi mishmash of uh, older architecture mixed with modern architecture, uh, modern artistic ideals. Uh, it's kind of a kind of an interesting walk down America. <laughs> okay, as promised, Main Street. Uh, it's all basically brick and mortar, 19th century, turn of the century work. Um, let's have you look at that instead of me. Now, I kind of gave you a look from the back from the distance. You can see the the storefronts, uh, some have changed over time. This is one of the older buildings on uh, Main Street. The front here, uh, old fashioned brick and mortar. Well, it's, fortunately this is, this one's closed. Maybe we can get a look in through the, ah, there we go. Kind of get a look. You can see the old style architecture on the inside. Uh, the doors are, I've been in this building, the doors, most of the doors are original from the time. If you look at that door there, that is a door that is about a hundred years old. It has a solid core and it has an old fashioned uh, key where you look in the old movies and they have that, uh, 
you know, like those old skeleton keys, those big iron keys that you stuffed in there and gave them a twist. Uh, the other door is the same. This is a more modern door here. Uh, here we have these doors are actually uh, a little of each. It is how the entryway was originally designed with an archway. You can see the keystone and I believe the doors have been replaced a couple times but they've tried really hard to keep that old feel and if you look here on the side somebody's made a nice little spot that's nice to sit here during the summer and enjoy the outdoors. You can look at the side of the building here though and see the construction. Uh, it's all brick and mortar. Uh, you can see how a building that was here at one time it burned out but you can see how it uh, they all interlock together. Uh, one's outside wall was the other's inside wall so when a building burns down it causes a lot of problems. Uh, it's very stable as long as one manages to stand up but if one of them falls down uh, it can quickly turn into a very large very ugly game of dominoes and that I hope you can see it that design in the brickwork on the top there uh, where they have the signing and above the windows uh, that is original that was done when the building was originally made so some, some of the original work has been preserved. You can see some buildings uh, had designs in them like that. Almost all of them had a design in their top like that at one time or another. Uh, the architecture here, you know, this is what would be considered at that time a fairly common storefront in uh, America. Uh, brick and mortar, everything hooked together, uh, everybody sharing a wall. Uh, you know, we, we do the same thing now essentially with strip malls, just different materials. And it was, I don't know, I think uh, in all the metal and uh, concrete and steel, it's kind of uh, lost a little something from uh, the old brick and mortar work like this. It has a certain, with the rocks, with the rocks and the uh, bricks coming together, it has a certain organic beauty, a certain flow, uh, a feel that, you know, more of a sense of permanence and not a glaring in, something that's glaring in your face and uh, unfriendly that isn't very warm. Uh, I would, I like being here in my small town. I like the warmth and the feel of it. And it's just, uh, it's one of those things that you can't find in the big cities anymore. Okay, next on the agenda of the Klickitat County Architecture Tour, we have the Centerville Community Church. Uh, this church was actually uh, one of the founders, original founders of it was my great 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 Uncle Peter Nimola uh, in the 1800s. And I'll let you take a look here instead of looking at me. And for the time, the church, as in many communities, was the tallest building in Centerville. Uh, once again, very simple construction, very utilitarian in nature, but a spire reaching to the heavens as a beacon to the community. So we've got the bell tower and inside of course is the church proper. If I'd known I was going to be doing this I would have arranged to get a hold of the key and go in and show you the inside. But unfortunately plans changed. <laughs> so on our trip 
is going to be the uh, Centerville School. And I'll talk about that more when we get there. Oh, and this concrete is unusual. Uh, the concrete foundation actually is unusual. And the concrete is unusual. Uh, this was a Finnish community, uh, Laplanders, Sami uh, Finns, and native, uh, the native natives of Finland. And they're, uh, they got together and they actually put the money into the concrete. Now you can see some of the concrete is a different color. You know, the darker gray versus the lighter gray. Uh, the darker gray is the older concrete. Uh, it, different, different types of, uh, mi differently mixed, differently made from a different era. Uh, but still a good grade. The concrete in the walkway is original. Some of the concrete on the stairway has been replaced, but the concrete in the foundation is still the original concrete as well. When I, uh, get home, I'll show you some of the, what the original concrete was, and I'll interview my father a little bit, uh, so he can give us an idea of what the structure of the concrete, how it was made, and that kind of thing. I mean, it's our, it's part of the architecture. Here I am at the Centerville School, uh, home of the Tigers. Uh, this building, originally my uh, grandfather was one of the first students to graduate, and it was from kindergarten through high school. It is brick and mortar. Uh, really, nothing about this building has changed in the last about 100 years, including that sign at the top. Um, the original pillars. I believe the concrete going up to the walkway has changed over time, but overall this building has remained essentially the same for the last hundred years. Uh, some modifications have been made like the fire escape from the second floor went from being the rickety wooden stairway that was there when I was a kid to a more modern, more stable structure. <laughs> uh, and then next to this is the old furnace house and the smokestack. Um, a tradition started where kids would paint the year that they uh, graduated on the smokestack. So that's an interesting bit of our architecture. But once again, this is one of those buildings where form follows function. It's fairly utilitarian, mortar and brick. Uh, not a not a extremely fancy structure but representative of the time frame. This was a recent addition in the last few years. Uh, the sign was paid for by the community and it's actually a dedication uh, to my friend I spoke of earlier, Master Sergeant Mark Coleman. Uh, he was, he was a good man, a very good man, and very admired in the community. Uh, having a permanent, permanent piece of art dedicated to him. And the school and the town that he loved so that much is, well, well, very important and very, well, important to me, I guess, but very appropriate. Okay, as promised, I have just gotten to the observatory here in Goldendale. A couple of quick fun facts. Um, the four gentlemen who donated the telescope originally to this observatory were amateur astronomers and they built the telescope 
uh, and they wanted to donate it to somebody. And it was actually a very high-tech telescope for its time. And so every university and uh, higher in learning institution and scientific center they went to, they were saying, hey, you know, we want the general public to be able to access this. And they all said, no, no, you don't. We're not going to let the general public use it. And that was their stipulation, that the general public be allowed to use it. Well, they were coming back... And they were frustrated, these four guys. And they were coming back through Goldendale, and they stopped at the restaurant in town. The mayor of Goldendale owned the restaurant at the time. And uh, he heard them talking, and he said, Hey, you know what? We have some land on top of this hill. We have no idea what to do with. We'd be willing to allow, put in a park where people can go and watch this. Now, for the fun, next fun fact... Because the Goldendale allowed the, this observatory to be built with this telescope, the, uh, uh, in the 70s, uh, when North America had the total eclipse, not a single institution would allow any TV cameras anywhere to hook up to the telescope to allow them to broadcast... The eclipse to the world, the only place in the entire planet that allowed anybody to do it was the Goldendale Observatory, and uh, Dan Rather was here. And uh, uh, the guy, the ranger at the time said, hey, I'll make you a deal. If you set up some screens and so that all these people here are trying to get a peek can watch, I'll let you hook up the... I'll let you hook up the telescope, the cameras to the telescope. And they said, okay. So they put up big screens here, and they broadcast it to the world. And it, any footage that we have today is because of this observatory and this telescope. So I'm going to go take some shots of the architecture. It is, once again, going to be form follows function. Okay, here we have, in the foreground, well the Washington State Parks truck, but then you see the dome for the telescope and the building. Uh, it's not many telescopes in this world that you can just walk up to, uh, take a look at, and go in and visit and have take a look at the planets and the moon. And uh, if you ever get the chance to visit this part of the world, I strongly recommend that you do it. The only publicly accessible telescope on the planet. Anybody with a Washington State Park Pass can walk up here and view the planets on a 24 and a half inch scope just like the ones you would get in an observatory and then we have, this one is a smaller one that I understand they use for solar viewing. And I'm not sure what that is. I'll have to take the tour and get a look. Oh, hello! Six inch refractor. The six inch refractor is on this side there. And this is the 24 and a half inch Cassegrain. And I mentioned that classical Cassegrain because a lot of people mis mis they confuse it with a, a Smith Cassegrain. So, have a plate, which it doesn't. so it's a classical Cassegrain, and opposed to a reflective, which we studied in the last chapter uh, when we discussed photography and that kind of thing. Uh, this was built by uh, four men, and on the condition of being allowed to simply be used for the average person, and I think I. Their names were Don Connor, John Marshall, M.W. McConnell, and uh, O.W. Vandervelden, dedicated in October of 1973. I was two years old. So there's the counterweight. The, the scope itself is 600 pounds. And this is a Casser grain. That is a Newtonian. They both use mirrors, uh, and they're parabolic. And the one on the side is a reflective lens. Refractive. 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 
I, I'm sorry. Grant, What's your name? Troy Carter. Troy. Troy. Nice to meet you. Michael, nice to meet you. Oh, I'll be editing that. But anyway, the uh, uh, park ranger Troy is helping me and uh, keeps uh, <laughs> uh, inside of a, you know, just a basic observatory dome uh, form following function. And it works perfectly, by the way. So. I would open it. Yeah, no, no, I know it's been rainy and horrible, and so it, you can just, I would recommend that if anybody ever gets a chance to travel to Washington, you come through Goldendale, not just visit the wineries in the, uh, in the gorge, but stop at the museum, make sure you come up here to the observatory, open every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 1 to 9, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. All right, well, thank you for watching. Uh, this was my uh, report for uh, architecture on uh, in uh, Aaron Jones's art class. I hope, uh, hope it was enjoyed. I hope it was appreciated. And I hope that the glaring production issues that I faced uh, <laughs> from my camera not working to because, and so having to use my iPhone to my video editing software crashing, to every everything, just everything going wrong, uh, the museum being closed, I mean, just everything went wrong. And I'm really hoping that, uh, that, you, that instead of, you know, seeing the museum, uh, that seeing the architecture around where I live, uh, basic hometown America architecture, form versus function, uh, some of that form can be very beautiful and uh, some of it like with the museum and Stonehenge and the observatory uh, can also be very unique and worth the trip to see. So thank you again for watching. Uh, I'm sorry for the production problems and uh, I well I hope you at least learned something because uh, I know I did. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day.